Namaskaram. Welcome to the Festival of Bharat. My name is Abhishek Naipathi and I will be your host today. As many of you know, one of the most beautiful aspects of Sanatana Dharma is the Sanskrit language. And here, I have a very special guest here today who is going to talk to us more about the beauty of Sanskrit and its connection to all the other Indic languages. Uh, many of you may already be familiar with this guest. His name is Mr. Uday Shriyasji. He runs the Sanskrit channel on YouTube where he discusses various Sanskrit literature and he tries to uncover the truths and wisdom that's within those texts. So with further ado, let me introduce Mr. Uday Shriyasji. Thank you. Namaste. Welcome to the show, Uday Ji. Namaste. Thank you so much, Abhishek Ji. Glad to be here. So the first question I have for you is, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? What led you to actually start the Sanskrit channel? Was this something you were always interested in as a child or was it something you picked up later? Okay. Um, so my education uh, has not been in the traditional Gurukul Vyavastha. I did my graduation in 2012 in electronics and communication engineering from Bitspilani. Um, and I got into a corporate job, which for many of my peers, I mean, even now in the generation before and now, now things are hoping up, uh, shaping up to be better. But for like all of my peers, most of my peers, I sought a job that would <laughs> give me a monthly income, settle uh, me into a financially uh, secure situation. But then once I got into the job, it was a cushy corporate lifestyle. Then I was just, you know, trying to get um, into better and better positions in the same company, shift companies. But at the same, uh, while doing all of that, there was this, um, I could see the situation around in, in terms of, you know, the colleagues that I have where I could be potentially you know, a few years down the line if I stick to this track. But that's not what I really wanted to do. That did not give me, um, you know, I, these words, very often overused words, fulfillment from within. So I was looking for various hobbies and uh, I, I would just, you know, take up all sorts of odd hobbies to just find that more pleasantness than the, you know, the monotony I was in. And I would... Uh, I was uh, fascinated by languages, all languages since childhood. There was this curiosity for sound and meaning, for similarities of words in various languages, uh, for differences in the meanings for the same sounds in various languages, this sort, this sort of thing. So Sanskrit just happened as one more of such hobbies. There was this colleague uh, when I was in uh, the first job, um, who wanted to learn Sanskrit for himself, uh, who was looking for a small study group. He saw that I was into all sorts of these hobby clubs and said, do you want to join me? I am interested in learning Sanskrit. I was surprised. I did not know that people learn Sanskrit still. There existed methods to learn Sanskrit. So I said, why not? Just one more hobby. And we used to uh, get onto it every single day and you know, formed a small study group of three, four people used to take the Gita Sopanam book and read it every single day. Uh, it, was, it was a small, nice study, study group, uh, which kind of continued. We held on that practice just as a language, not no spiritual aspects of it, no, you know, the in-depth, um, the profundity of the culture that is behind it. None of that stuff, just language for language's sake. And that, I don't know. It just, <laughs> it was a gateway drug of sorts that I kind of got pulled in more and more. And it led me, it opened gates towards literature, which eventually opened up uh, Shastras, which led me towards Yoga Sutras, which confounded me beyond my own uh, limited intellect. Um, then went on a search of sorts as to what is being mentioned in all these things. Is this even real? Is this possible? Which opened up further and further. And I went through that rabbit hole, didn't it? Just swallowed me whole. And uh, as I kept doing it, things kind of transformed, lifestyle transformed. I uh, lost taste in what used to be, uh, what I used to find uh, attractive before. And I saw something 
which is much more profound which is much more fulfilling and which which i did not really invest any of my time or effort doing since until that point of time so i thought if this is the best place there is to invest my time and energy doing so i started doing that and um, quit my job uh, went in went to the sadhana of yoga and then once i kind of found my space within myself as to you know the sadhana that i had to put in the uh, you know the path the clarity that i had to find in life i thought um, i have to teach and i did not really want to go back to the corporate structure again and um, i started teaching in temples in workshops apartments to children to small groups of people um uh, but that fortunately it's it's another whole segment into itself it did not uh, reach as many people i really wanted to find that that reach for the presentations the, whatever i had to teach because there there was so much that i had to learn for myself uh so once i present something learn something and present it i can go to the next topic for myself to learn and and explore and then present so i thought uh, digital content creation is the best way to go forward with that to just you know um uh, maximize my return on the effort that i put in in terms of the impact of reach the number of people who find that uh, content and uh, so in 2018 i started with um, small shlokas and stotras uh, that i had learned and that a lot of my uh, uh, fellow sadhakas also learned so there was your uh, guru paduka stotram nirvana shatakam so i started making explainer videos of those and since 2018 this has been my thing that i would i present um stotras and shlokas learn something new for myself so it's been a journey since then did you at any point during your childhood was was there exposure to any of this or was it more like you kind of knew of it but it wasn't really something you were interested at the time you said you had some interest in languages but did you like have yes. any exposure to sanskrit back then yeah yeah definitely um as not not um classes or any sort of special education i like i said my main focus was to just get good grades get good marks learn the academic syllabus that there was but sanskrit in one way or the other is there in the ambience either in terms of shlokas that we chant or you know um, if, if not in our house in the neighbor's house or on tv somewhere or the other you hear these shlokas you kind of in calendar imagery there is some you know there's some education happening so in that sense yes i was uh, aware and introduced to all of this but my curiosity for languages started because my father uh, used to get transferred every 3 years and uh, every new place we go there's a different dialect there's a different language you need to make new friends again you know connect with them and language is the best uh, medium the first most basic medium to connect with people and so in that sense out of a necessity and, and that that curiosity for languages that fascination started if if i did not cope up with that um you know there's no way to make new friends and there's no way to you know connect with your peers so i started getting better at it i uh, the shlokas the sanskrit aspect of it was not at the forefront ever in my studies during my uh, plus plus 2 the intermediate 11th and 12th class as some people call it uh, i did opt for uh, sanskrit as the language just because that is one of the languages where you can score better the scoring the marks are le- more lenient people uh, you can score 98 99 if not 100 in sanskrit language but i wouldn't say it added any uh, unfortunately any any value to my sanskrit learning thankfully it did not put me off of it so much that is the best i could have hoped for still to this date unfortunately that is how the academic curriculum is imparted um 
but yes i did kind of hear the terms the shlokas here and there but never paid any special attention to it um my serious learning any sort of imbibing of sanskrit language as such only started um uh, in when i was in the first job 21 when i was 21 years of age not too late but it's never too late because most of us in one way or the other have sanskrit in our lives even if we notice it or not but telugu which was my first language growing up in andhra pradesh um i was very curious about i used to love poetry in english telugu and hindi so languages i was always curious about on your channel what what topics have you covered so far and maybe you can give examples of certain uh certain literature that you've covered and what topics are you looking to cover in the future all right um so it's it's an ocean right sanskrit literature is endless it's i mean it's not, it's i'm really not exaggerating when i say it's endless because uh it's enormous what what has been passed down to us i try to look at it at uh, in, in different categories there are again various kinds of classifications that people have done so that this entire ocean of uh, knowledge becomes accessible you find you know access points to all of these texts and traditions mm, how i have thought about it is there are four steps of mastery there are four things that a beginner needs to learn uh it, this is in my approach before i get there i'll get give you a more traditional approach there are the shad angas of vedas so you might have heard about this there is shiksha vyakarana chandas nirukta jyotish and kalpa so these are the four six uh, various limbs of the vedas so shiksha is all about the sounds of it how you utter the alphabet of sanskrit what is the origin of it um you know um, it it is not really it's never like just you know memorize this set of vowels and consonants and these are the conjugations of vowels and consonants and you're done the in the very origin of sound all of sanskrit can be realized every set of every one of these six limbs is like that it is not that you have to go step by step by step you approach it from any of these six limbs all of sanskrit is there to be realized right there so for example the sounds that we were just talking about the shiksha aspect of it the sounds of sanskrit are said to originate from shiva's damaru itself when he struck it 14 times the 14 sounds sequence of sounds are called as maheshwara sutrani and from that panini extracted the 4000 rules of grammar nandi heard those 14 sounds and expounded upon the principles of creation so there are you know profound observations about the nature of creation and about the nature of the created the self in learning the sounds of a language and from there when we go to vyakarana which is grammar once again it is not just this is the sandhi this is the samasa this is you know these two sounds combined to form this sound that is there at the physical level of it but if you look at it in a more profound sense we find again so why are sounds coming together in that sense what is the technology of of these sounds that have come about in creation what do they represent in the cosmic scape what do they represent within ourselves like we were just having this conversation about the chakras the sapta chakras within the body they each of them have different petals or energy centers individually all the seven which add up to 52 which is the number of letters of the alphabet again 
so shiksha vyakarana chandas which is roughly translated as the metrical traditions which is the rhythm of creating sentences from sounds to grammar to sentences uh, it's it's again extremely poetic extremely beautiful while at the same time very profound from there we go to shastras there is enormous literature from sentences in chandas to um, there is nirukta which is etymology which is again a very profound study of how sounds have meaning within themselves how words which are which hold meaning in in them are formed from more rudimentary sounds so that is nirukta and from there there is you know there are shastras there are various shastras from yoga to ayurveda to jyotisha vastu tantra rasayana any field of study that we can possibly think of there has been very profound observations and perceptions that have been made into it maybe they are not as um as extensively searched or put into practice as modern sciences the western sciences are but in terms of their profoundness in what i mean by that is in terms of how it what it means to us as life on earth you know not in terms of some uh, how is it applicable in some sort of technology how does it make us give us material gains all of these branches of study are much more profound in their observation in that sense so and there is there are the vedangas the Up- the upanishads of course um 108 of them and more and then there are the vedas themselves so on our channel uh, i have touched upon bits and pieces of this you know everywhere there are there is ishavasya upanishad there is patanjali yoga sutras some aspects of artha shastra panchatantra and more stotras a uh, little bit of vyakaranam so i have touched upon many aspects just to give a taste of all of this right so to just touch upon everything across the the entire you know how many hour course meal this can be so i touched upon everything but the four steps that i was talking to you about it starts with getting our pronunciations right because the meaning is inherent within the sound that is how sanskrit is structured the fundamentals of uh, the entire gamut of literature and language lie in this fact that sound and meaning vak and artha are intertwined so when you say something utter a sound there is something inherent meant by that sound and if you want to address something mean something or touch or convey an aspect that you want to there is a particular sound which is you know which conveys that so that interconnectedness of sound and meaning is the first step to get that pronunciation right then it comes conversatory fluency sambhashana sanskritam which is called as bhasha prayogah from there you go towards literature which is you know worldly literature kavyas shastras all that we touched about right natya sangeeta and ayurveda tantra jyotisha nirukta ganita and from there to more spiritual literature like the darshana shastras uh, none of this is philosophy i never want to use the word philosophy it's about perspective darshana literally means vision so philosophies we never had it's it's a mental nonsense so we just learned at there, there is just that one truth have to approach that truth we never really made mental models of creation we knew that the all these outpourings of the sages are from that perspective of realizing what there is in creation and then presenting a perspective for us to follow and there is these that is what spirituality meant for us um so there are these uh, darshana shastras there are upanishads and vedas which are in the more spiritual realm so these are the four steps 
ವಾಕ್ಶುದ್ಧಿ ಭಾಷಾ ಪ್ರಯೋಗ ಕಾವ್ಯ ಪರಿಚಯ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ಫೈನಲ್ ಫೋರ್ತ್ ಒನ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ನಿಗಮಾಗಮ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೋರೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ಡಿಡ್ ಎ ಲಿಟಲ್ ಬಿಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ದೋಸ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆಂಟೆಡ್ ವಾಕ್ಶುದ್ಧಿ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಟೆಪ್ ಆಸ್ ಅ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಚಾನಲ್ ವೇರ್ ವಿ ಗೋ ಥ್ರೂ ದಟ್ ಮಹೇಶ್ ಮಾಹೇಶ್ವರ ಸೂತ್ರಾಣಿ ನಂದಿಕೇಶ್ವರ ಕಾಶಿಕ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ದೆರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಮಾಡ್ಯೂಲ್ ಟು ಟೆಸ್ಟ್ ಒನ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಇಫ್ ದ ನ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹಣ್ಣ ಸ ಶ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸ ಇಫ್ ಯು ನೋ ತ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ಥ ಥ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಧ ಇಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ಸೌಂಡ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಅಟರ್ಡ್ ಕರೆಕ್ಟ್ಲಿ ಸೊ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಟೆಪ್ ಸೊ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ದಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ಗೋನ್ ಬಿ ಮೈ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಇಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಬೆಸ್ಟ್ ವೇ ಟು ಲರ್ನ್ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತ ಇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ದ ವೇ ದಟ್ ಯುರ್ ಮೆನ್ಶನಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪ್ರಾಸೆಸ್ ದಟ್ ವುಡ್ ಬಿ ideal in my my perspective but that that's the uh, how do i put it that's both the boon and bane that we have that there is no really one access point you can really start with any of these pursuits you if you find a real you know capable acharya you can sit with them and get into the tatva of it the spiritual aspects of it nigamagamam you can start with some upanishad and get into sanskritam if not you can if you if you are more inclined towards ganita you can take up leelavati ganitam or some mathematical text and that could be your entry into sanskritam this four step by step thing is in my perspective vital because Uh, these these kind of form a pyramid the foundation of it is to get the pronunciations right how you work on it how you get towards perfecting your pronunciations there are you know innumerable number of entry points so this is one of the most common questions i get what is the best way to start learning sanskrit there are many but many things help i would say uh, form a focus group where you can talk to each other when you can correct each other which keeps you on track uh, one sutra comes to mind which is uh, in patanjali yoga sutras again it is said that if you want to get good at something dridha bhumi you want to establish yourself in something properly firmly as a skill then there are these factors that need to be followed which is dirgha kala nairantarya satkara sevitah dridha bhumi so if something is done for a long time dirgha kala without any breaks nirantar nairantarya comes from nirantar no gaps ni antar and satkara it has to be approached with a certain sense of reverence if these three things are done you approach something for a long, for long time without breaks with that reverence you were grounding in it will be firm dridha bhumi so how you do that practice is up to you thank you for your explanation thank you um so this actually leads me to another question which is is there any connection between the sounds in sanskrit and elements of nature um i believe uh, i heard something i could be wrong but i heard something about uh some of the 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 words kind of being framed after animal sounds i don't know if there's any truth to that no no um so nandikeshwara kashika that i was talking about goes into this in a very profound sense the let me get into it so what your question now necessitates that i go a little deeper into this technical into this let me keep it uh, beginner friendly these sounds that first came about from which sanskrit has evolved are said to be the sounds of shiva's damaru itself when he struck his damaru 14 times the four set of sounds that came out are a e urna this seems like you know this is something man made okay somebody has actually theorized that a e urna sounds no Nan- then comes nandikeshwara kashika which commentates upon these set of sounds saying a e urna akara brahma rupa syat nirguna sarva vastushu that a is the attribute less all pervading presence in every aspect of creation if we look at it in that sense 
ah the most primal sound is you know that which has no attributes that which is has no special character or or any taste or color of itself it is the ubiquitous presence then comes chitkalam im samashritya by merging itself with the consciousness which is denoted by the sound e the material creation which is represented by the sound u un jagad roop un ishwara so based on those sounds that came from shiva's damaru the first set this is how creation happened there was that attributeless presence of a then the sound of consciousness e got in touch with it both of them then together formed material creation un so that is how you know you, your question how are these sounds in nature connected with that so all of these sounds are very primal primitive in that sense that they are present and felt in all aspects of creation when you asked how other creatures around you know how they bark you know chirp or moo or you know all sorts of sounds it is seen that all physical creation is just sound so even in their even if something articulates that sound or is just there as some sort of reverberance or just any any kind of life form animate or inanimate kind of presence all of them have that reverberance associated with them and there is this sound and from this comes this observance of you know shapes and forms and corresponding sounds of that forms so a tree has a specific sound associated with it and a bird a, the sun moon everything that there is so that perception of sound that is associated with some form of creation is called as ritambhara pragnya pragnya the gnya is knowing knowledge pragnya is a special kind of knowing perception ritambhara pragnya is that kind of perception where you can perceive physical creation around you in its most fundamental as reverberance and sound itself so that from that level of perception all of these pursue all of these shastras came about so nandikeshwara kashika goes on further to describe all the other 14 sounds how the pancha bhutas how the three gunas you know how uh, the pancha karma indriyas pancha gnana indriyas what are the sounds corresponding to each of them how creation formed but it it's good and very fascinating to learn about all these things as information right it kinds of builds that curiosity about oh there seems to be something which is more fundamental here at play but the the more mind blowing kind of truth here is there is that perception perception within a human being which is capable of perceiving these things Th- that is within human capability and you know potential to get to that state to, to refine oneself to that state that is the whole pursuit that has been the objective of all traditions of this land is not to worship some sort of god up there but to realize that presence of divine within either through bhakti gnana kriya or you know karma and live as one with this entire creation so yeah those sound is you me everything else around us just to nada brahma as they call it so now can we uh i want to talk a little bit about the actual language itself can you maybe give a little history of sanskrit um maybe what is the oldest evidence that we have of it or you know how far back do we actually think it goes in terms of um a calendrical age right yeah if if you can give something like that or this this 6000 bc or is it 7000 bc is it 14000 yeah. <laughs> bc the thing is our counting goes into you know 10 to the power of right. 7 10 to the power of 12 <laughs> so i i would like to uh 
position myself in those stories okay to find palm leaf manuscript uh evidences where you can date these languages that oh because this evidence is found this is when the language must have evolved this is when the script must have evolved i would leave that to the physician i don't know what to call them to the physical evidence collectors of the world but from our puranas there is much more they might not be factual but there is much more truth to seeing creation as going back to spans of not millennia which is thousands of years but millions of years right so our calculation of yugas of maha yugas of kalpas of manvantaras there is enormous literature there that there were you know these 14 manus and then the you know it goes from the most minutest of units of time that there is a truti which is just a fraction probably i think uh 10 to the power of minus 4 or minus 6 of a second to whatever else the the highest number of fraction 10 to the power of 32 and beyond and that level of counting and that level of mathematics goes be- beyond so how old is sanskrit older than all of this in my <laughs> in my uh, humble submission which might not see for uh, people who who want these exact calculations and physical dates might uh, you know uh, scrunch up their noses at this answer that oh just tell us how old this is maybe this is if beyond this there was no earth there was no uh, you know solar system but uh, our perception goes beyond that before before there was solar system before there was creation there was brahma who came, who gave birth to all of this brahma is a sanskrit term so i would say sanskrit's relevance and existence came into creation when creation came about so how old is sanskrit it's as old as creation itself and beyond that so that is why we are call ourselves sanatana dharma and this is what i would also i i'd like to take this opportunity um to uh, to encourage all of us also to have to own up that kind of thinking right there is an indic way of thought there is an indic way of being interacting with each other of conducting our lives eating food all of this sitting standing from what we how how we interact with seasons what kind of food we consume how we consume it this is what the westerners came <laughs> in search of braving the oceans braving the storms you know drowning in their ships <laughs> they came to just get some of our food some of our clothing <laughs> right and our all of that is again a product of our way of thought our way of living our way of conducting ourselves so i i am a very strong proponent of bringing that all back uh while at the same time you know there, there are a lot of uh, comforts and conveniences in terms of technology in terms of reach in terms of external um empowerments that the western approach to the world and uh success has brought us but internal aspects of of you know being settled within oneself in one's own skin one's own uh from the most commonness the most basic of one's sexuality to the most finest of one's spirituality everything across right how we conduct our food <laughs> uh it's on youtube so food fucking to everything else so there is kama sutras from us so all these pursuits of came from that uh perception and that way of existing in creation so again i went on a little bit of a long rant but i would say how we need to kind of uh own up to this sort of living to this sort of thinking that we as creatures here our 
consciousness that is within and everything else our, our temples our textiles our food our culture goes transcends time and that is why it is sanatana if we set a time that this is when it started it's no longer sanatana yeah see that i i really like that answer a lot it's i think in a modern times it's very it's very difficult to wrap our heads around such a concept that you know we are eternal that we've existed here since maybe before the universe itself it, it, this is what sets us apart yeah. <laughs> this is what gives us that unique flavor which nobody else had as a civilization and that is why none of the other cultures are sanatana they never gotten around to the concept of something which is eternal mm-hmm. oh, so thank, right? thank you zero is eternal so th- people think oh zero 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 no but it's not just just something which is no counting or nothing something which is nothing is something which is everything it's, it's some it's something which is the most profound and it came it is not just somebody's random shava thought zero it's some it's a civilizational truth that this is what we identify with this is what our uh this is what our whole existence and our, from our ancestors to everybody just soaks in this kind of an ambience everything is to make us realize that we are one part of that whole that that larger purna so can, uh, can we now talk about what role the sanskrit play in in the indian society and uh, maybe can you also explain the difference between what's called vedic sanskrit and classical sanskrit because uh is there really a difference or is you know this way of labeling does it actually make sense according to uh from your your point of view uh, i i will answer that question i'll not go on a rant but before to stop myself <laughs> not going on to a rant this again splitting that oh, there is this there is tantra and there is veda there is shaktism vishnu worship shiva worship splitting 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 categorizing it as oh no this is different subject this is all you know not some not traditions of thought that are our own but there exists a distinction between what is found in the vedas as mantras there is of course samhita part uh, of vedic uh, literature if you call, call it literature so there is a, what can be distinctly seen as vedic sanskrit and a laukika sanskrit uh let's again i don't want to use this english terminology of classical what is uh, you know whatever else uh, but there is distinctly a vedic sanskrit and laukika sanskritam which is just because both of them are for very different purposes vedika sanskritam is to invoke the forces of creation and make them work to your benefit or to uplift yourself and use it in some sort of a ritual so of course this combination of sounds that are used there i wouldn't use it when you know conversing with you right so of course there is a different set of sounds and there is a set of grammar for conversing for worldly things and for you know the larger uh, more esoteric abstract aspects of creation so that is where the distinction comes from i would again urge every single person who wants to learn sanskrit to please not read people's opinions even if it is my own just stay with the most you know foundational aspects of language pour over the sounds that is where the entire secret lies that is where the key to opening up the entire civilizational treasure is opinions and you know people this is about this is like uh, you know people critiquing poetry you can either be relish poetry and be one with it or you can you know whenever as soon as you get dissecting poetry into you know to to understand it to grade it it's lost so that is what happens when you start looking at vedika sanskritam and laukika sanskritam something else something else right so it's all sound and what is implied by that sound 
so as long as we stick there we'll find our answers which are which can be just supremely fulfilling okay so i mean i so then in that case what role would you say sanskrit played in indian society whether it was ancient indian society even up to up until very recently so what was like the role of sanskrit society when when you use the word society um samskritam and samskriti they are not two different elements so there is no samskriti without samskritam there is no samskritam if there is no samskriti so it's once again it is that uh, interconnected in relationship between sound and meaning if uh, sanskrit i would say is the spine of the entire uh, civilizational treasure and everything that is connected with it it is not because of sanskrit that society shaped up the way it is or it is not because of society that they came up with sanskrit as a language it is you know it is both it's, it's really hard to grasp like that so what is the role of sanskrit in shaping the society it's it works both ways it is because of that profound perception what comes first in all of these you know circles and and, and chicken egg kind of questions is human flowering so when somebody finds full expression and full capabilities the f- find full flowering of their capabilities as human being and when society at large does not shun such beings but looks up to them as somebody who has reached a state within themselves all our sages from agastya panini patanjali kashyap all of these people who are revered across the land they gave outpourings of all of these knowledge systems and they chose invariably all of them they created came up cre- definitely with this perfectly crafted language which is self sufficient which is very profound in terms of observing the relationship between sound and meaning which stays eternal as eternal as their realizations within are so for the eternal realizations that they had within they found an eternal language and then conveyed different aspects of society which then cr- crafted you know different practices and different greeting methods you know different ways of aachara vyavahara all of those things so that that word sanatana really echoes in all of these aspects both language and culture what is the relationship between sanskrit and the other languages of india mm-hmm. so i i really don't know the exact number here somebody i don't think anybody has done exact studies in these fields to uh, you know authoritatively present that this is the overlap between sanskrit vocabulary and regional vocabulary be it bengali kannada telugu marathi gujarati how much of that language and the vocabulary in it is i wouldn't even say borrowed from sanskrit this is the problem whenever we, our minds really have been attuned so uh you know ingrained into this kind of unfortunately a western outlook which is very material dissection of things which is helpful to some extent that if there are commonalities something must have been borrowed from something or oh, this is the la- this is the loan language this is the borrower language this is the lending language there could be something more fundamental there right even if it is tamil which definitely by the signs of it grew as a separate language uh field as a whole another civilization in itself which is very complete again from the likes of tiruvalluvar and agastyar so it's all from these sages who had these profound perceptions in different regions of the land so how did sanskrit influence regional languages 
as a mother would that is why they keep saying right sanskrit is the mother of all indic languages for sure um so <laughs> i i keep having these conversations very funny very very light hearted conversations which are very profound with other uh, indian language teachers who are in uh, who are, who are uh, in my um, circle they i mean all of all of us are as passionate about our own mother tongues then but you know saying uh i don't know akash does not belong to kannada or telugu but it was borrowed from sanskrit is blasphemous for people who speak telugu and kannada because it is theirs you can't say sanskrit is some other language and this you know telugu and kannada just borrowed these terms from sanskrit they are their own terms so it is as good as you know one one family literally of you people who have that relationship with their family knows that something which is you know as close as a mother of something of mothers is theirs without a doubt it's not like you borrowed something from them it's a part of you so in that sense sanskrit is a part integral part of every indian language of every bharatiya bhasha bhasha as a term is a sanskrit term so if you say kannada telugu but each of them had their own unique different characteristics they developed their own unique traits based on various factors regional based on the you know climatic conditions based on um, the cuisines what is available as food in that region uh, bengali developed its own different quirks so there are you know uh, vandya upadhyaya vandya respectable upadhyaya teacher becomes bandopadhyay it almost sounds very different from sanskrit but it is sanskrit and you know uh, namaskaram becomes namaskara in kannada namaskaramu in telugu namaskar or namaste in north indian languages it's it's the same set of sounds which found their own unique expressions but they all find their commonality with sanskrit to what extent is i don't think it is even a statistic that can be accurately arrived at that yes 56.3% is what sanskrit's contribution is it's it's never such a thing because if you want a new term in any language it's best to con, uh, you know coin that new word in sanskrit and it gels well with every other word in that language so that is how the relationship between sanskrit and regional languages of bharat is now is there any um i i've heard a little bit about this but i i wanted to get your perspective is there any tamil influence on sanskrit <laughs> uh the, the thing is sanskrit as a language is quite self sufficient in itself with all its root sounds the dhatus and the panini really left no necessity for loaning anything from other languages or to be influenced by something if you want to present something convey something anything in creation the the more fundamental aspects not something like uh you know something of the modern day inventions of maybe uh a, you know electroencephalogram you might not find the exact term in sanskrit but you can coin it but the the more eternal aspects of creation and the self you need really need not look for terms which do not find their uh, presence in sanskrit grammar samskritam samyakritam is is very self sufficient in that sense so are there tamil terms i don't think so tamil ta- but tamil in itself the tamil grammar and sanskrit grammar are 
in 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 their uh, most um, fundamental are exactly the same the how they are structured but because again tolka pm it's all from the sages of the past who had that perception of per- perception into the actual nation nature of creation around us so from that whatever has come of course is going to be allied sciences there is going to be some commonality here there everywhere so the exact influence that this particular word from sanskrit is taken from tamil i really don't know if there are any such instances uh but if there are the i would say i would definitely you know the my first instinct would be to uh see that the source of such happening is because of you know the the kind of perception from which it originated the, because of the nature of the source of origin of these both these languages and their grammatical systems it's from that perception both tamil and telugu and uh, sanskrit there is this one story like i was telling you um all of sanskrit language and literature and the grammatical rules came from shiva's damaru for sanskrit for even tamil it is the same story yeah that's interesting i've heard that so to merge that there is another story which says from one side of the tam- damaru sanskrit sounds came about and for the other side from the other side of the damaru tamil same sounds came about but tamil definitely is much more um, how do i put it um is much more uh simple in its in its structure not in terms of grammar it's quite complex uh and in terms of expression but in there are no mahaprana sounds there are no uh, you know uh, ushmana sounds so sh ch is the same ta da pa ba so these and there is no tha dha or pha gh this kind of mahaprana sounds are not there it's to be g or just ch ta or the ta and the are interchangeably used so it's a little more um, simplistic in its set of sounds but with that set of sounds it gives sanskrit literature a run for its money so there is no really there is no saying which is really the better language because sanskrit has a more complete uh set of sounds as it in its fundamental framework the alphabet uh but tamil without that kind of extensive sound set has the entire terminology the entire set of words and grammar with the same basic set of sounds which with with a with fewer sounds than sanskrit so this is how they both are That's really uh, interesting to hear because a lot of times you uh, when people speak about history they about Indian history they'll talk about Sanskrit and Tamil like they were sort of opposing forces in a sense like <laughs> no. Sanskrit was like this imposition <laughs> into the subcontinent and it's just, it's kind of mm, there is some political truth to it okay. I won't negate it please don't edit it out okay, okay. <laughs> it's it might come across as some kind of politically uh, you know uh, abrasive statements but there is truth to it uh even in my video comments i keep seeing these kinds of uh observations which are not really the most civil uh from north indian you know uh, hindi speaking belt or you know the whole region uh and there definitely has been f there have been multiple efforts to kind of impose hindi at the cost of other languages Uh, in the south but uh, of, of course <laughs> the maximum resistance comes from tamil because there is so much there to you know to push back there is enormous treasures there i i see both the sides there is th- these kind of situations are always nuanced it's not like oh these are the people to blame or oh, no these are the people to blame i hope people see that need for a unifying language between people it's really really unfortunate that that unifying language between us bharatiyas has to be english at this point of time it's sad like cricket is the unifying force <laughs> and english is the unifying language uh, 
really unfortunate but to oppose that to impose hindi which in itself has so many other uh, problems to battle within itself like hindi no longer sounds hindi it's almost you know uh uh these terms it's corrupt <laughs> these will again be very abrasive terms to use but there is a lot of uh elimination of hindi terms which have which has happened because of external invasions it it's romantic it's it's really uh, it's pushed by uh, mainstream media as well mostly bollywood um that if a song has to be you know romantically um up pleasing you can't use sanskrit terms you the, the urdu terms or arabic terms parsi terms these are substituted there is again beauty in those terms too i'm not against any of these other languages either they are simpler they don't have as many uh, mahapranas or uh, samyukta aksharas so they definitely sound more simple to the ear and breezy this this whole politics of sound what is against there is politics to it but i would say anybody who sees value in language in general and approaches all of these languages for what they have to offer at their core will see this and appreciate the literature of every language there is to offer and and especially the value of languages of bharat yeah, it seems like our ancestors didn't have that much of a problem with this like it was it was easier for them to kind of accept uh, all the differences in our language exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly it was not like we were you know we had one common language across multiple states right. when the cholas the marathas you know the rashtrakutas the pallavas the cheras right right when they were all ruling it the pieces of land kalinga went really you know hand in hand with uh, you know the people down south west east up north da- south all the way across uh, cambodia and indonesia yeah people were traveling back and forth you know interacting with each other and shared that uh, same um, value systems if i have to call it that right right a uh, same kind of approach and perception to right. uh, to creation around us how the, the fundamental fabric of what unites us as bharat has been the same independent of uh, what language we speak sanskrit definitely is at the heart of it mm-hmm. but every language tradition has uh, had its own giants of literature in in who again compiled m- marvelous pieces of literature in their own language and in sanskrit yeah. so from madhva from uh, uh, ramanujacharya adi shankara down in uh, malayali malayalam land right. uh, to uh, kulashekhar narayana bhattadri uh, to all the other regional you know jayadeva to the east and kanada to the west so every um every sage and seer of some of metal was an expert in that own regional language and in sanskrit it was never one at the cost of the other oh that's really interesting to hear you know what yeah. what's also interesting is a lot of times people associate the, the devanagari script with sanskrit like they'll assume that that is mm. the sanskrit script but there's actually no script for sanskrit <laughs> yeah. correct like there's no actual no. so uh for like for example the mahabharata was written in all the regional scripts but the sounds would mm-hmm. be sanskrit if if i'm not mistaken uh so it would actually the be... sun yeah can you explain a little bit right. yes yes so devanagari has come to be the most conducive um script most extensive for uh sanskrit but it has its own limitations uh i would in fact argue that telugu kannada and malayalam are much more conducive to write 
தேவ்நாகரின் தமிழ் நாட் ஆஸ் மச் பிகாஸ் ஆஃப் த லேக் ஆஃப் மகாபிராண சவுண்ட்ஸ் பட் தேவநாகரி டஸ் நாட் ஹாவ் ஹ்ரஸ்வ ஏ அண்ட் யூனோ ஓ சவுண்ட்ஸ் விச் ஆர் ப்ரெசென்ட் இன் தெலுங்கு கன்னடா அண்ட் மலையாளம் இன்ஃபேக்ட் தே சே குஜராத்தி ஹாஸ் ஹ்ரஸ்வ ஏ அண்ட் ஓ அட் ஒன் பாயிண்ட் ஆஃப் டைம் பட் இட் yeah like you said devnagari is just one of the many scripts in which uh, sanskrit can be written down this tradition has always been oral it has been passed down as something that you carry within you not you know something written and and documented up the attic so it has uh, been like that through the past so yeah i agree with what you said devnagari is just one of the many other scripts now uh what is some of the ongoing research and developments in the study of sanskrit so for example i i remember hearing about i think nasa was trying to uh use sanskrit because they felt it was the best language for their ai uh machine learning uh technology so uh, is there is there anything like that you're familiar with um I, I, allow me to go on a little bit of a rant yeah, yeah. if it's no, okay that's fine yeah uh when it comes to the application that's what you're asking yeah. me what are when see most of the research and and pursuit of human intellect mm-hmm. where like pushing the boundary of how where what we know where we are as as, as humans at large people are thinking oh let's now move to mars let's <laughs> colonize mars is, how is colonizing something not a banned term yet right we are all gung ho about colonizing mars colonizing another planet really when this is in ruins already this is what the cutting edge of science and application of technology is and we want more and more effort to go in that direction we want to see how every human mind how every human empowerment that there is is used in these pursuits that you know we burn up more more fuel on the planet or we uh desert this to colonize some other to just eat up more resources this is just karma went unchecked that you want to just eat up more we, we have not done uh, you know had our fill eating up this planet we want to go eat up one more if not move beyond the stars there was some discussion on some podcast i remember what podcast i don't want to name names that we can set up a nuclear power plant as many as we want on the moon no downside what big deal big deal really that is what we want, we want to do to the moon and then we are surprised when calamities hit us oh how did this happen and with the questions of ai programming whatever else right um, cutting edge machine learning neuro linguistic whatever sanskrit its utility is targeted inwards it is a language which can give us fulfillment it sounds like contentment contentment seems like a such a bad word to use in the age we are in because of again that unchecked consumption that if you are content with something you found your peace with creatures around oh they you are not making any progress anymore are you so this is how it has become so of course sanskrit grammar has enormous precision of structure of geometry there are precise rules and if there are any exceptions to those rules those are clearly stated out it's no longer you know put is put c it is cut you know these kind of arbitrary sounds everything is very precise so of course there is going to be very little if not any ambiguity when something is conveyed in sanskrit of course it makes a lot of sense for all of us to be conveying in this language co- conversing in this language which makes such beautiful utilization of all of the organs of our vocal cavity right so when we speak english it's every language has its own unique signature vocal signature 
which you know kind of makes use of different organs of our vocal cavity sanskrit just speaking it works as a beautiful pranayama is it not an application of sanskrit as a language just doing that just pursuing the sub- sa- sciences of sanskrit settles the body and the mind it makes the mind sharper while not making it restless empowering something making it sharp while settling it and being making it bringing in a sense of ease isn't that the best thing what one can do with one's own life and if it's the best thing that one can do with one's own life it's a, of course the best thing that the society at large can do and this is why people flogged and still do and look at the east for spiritual answers because whatever one has consumed in one's life has not fulfilled them yet you want to you know add uh more stuff to your fire to quench that karma agni it will only burn further so you need to ha- know how to handle that and in that pursuit to use sanskrit in that direction would be a responsible use of such a powerful tool can this be used to take us to mars and beyond can can this be used to make our gadgets uh more efficient in terms of their you know coding the terms of energy that they use on the planet because the coding is much more efficient close packed it could be i don't know if there is any research that has been done in that direction definitely a lot of our mathematics has influenced western mathematics and the counting going back to the trope of the often used but very rarely really understood zero <laughs> it's if anything it is the only thing that anybody has to realize if i can put it that so there are much better ways of going about that research uh, again there are many many fields like ayurveda and yoga which are immediately impactful which is what the world largely looks for uh there is enormous research happening still in the in those directions as to how to understand the prescriptions of ayurveda how to make it largely marketed and ma- mass produced so that they are efficient uh, but in my humble submission thank you so much for allowing me this rant <laughs> um the real utilization and application of sanskrit is towards individual growth internally not towards some not towards being the same colonizers and, and going somewhere and right. doing something else there you, that, that others have gone to us yeah, that's the main application of sanskrit there's nothing better than your yep. personal development your internal growth um and lastly i would like um i guess just to, just to wrap up on uh what what would be your closing remarks what message do you have to to our audience on sanskrit let's do one uh, shloka okay. let's uh, why why add with more uh, information uh, when the whole rant i have taken up enough of your time and your thank you uh, for uh, providing your platform so that it can reach more people what my effort can reach more people if there is one thing that i would like people to learn whichever language uh, namaskaram namaskara namaste uh, to everybody from all different languages across the globe if you want to learn one thing just internalize sanskrit this is not something that you just carry in your head as information or see where it can be applied what utility can i get externally out of it let's you know internalize it relish one particular sound just one shloka or you know just dwell on any profound aspect of sanskrit let's close with one nice shloka which uh, kind of depicts the nature of zero okay <laughs> uh, and which also depicts completeness and wholeness so in tamil also for that matter zero is called as purnam okay or pujyam in many in telugu it's pujyam it's, it's 
uh, that which is worship worthy <laughs> zero because it is the form that is complete right. denotes completeness so it's the most popular uh, very well known shloka called purnamada purnamidam mm. probably most of the viewers also know this so let's just end on that note okay just imbibing relishing sanskrit ಪೂರ್ಣಮದ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಿದ ಪೂರ್ಣಾತ್ ಪೂರ್ಣಮುದಚ್ಯತೆ ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾದಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಾವಶಿಷ್ಯತೆ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 Namaste. Thank you very much for your time with AG. Um lastly, I would like to say to everybody if uh, you found value from this video, please like, share, subscribe and please follow the Sanskrit channel as well. Thank you for your time with AG. Namaste. My pleasure. <laughs>